and welcome to our discussion of Respiratory Culture Workup. I'm Yvette McCarter, the Director of the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory at UF Health Jacksonville in Jacksonville, Florida. At the end of today's presentation, you'll be able to discuss the value of the gram stain smear as a reliable rapid diagnostic tool, discuss criteria for assessing specimen quality by microscopic screening, describe recognition and reporting of organisms by genera rather than organism morphology, discuss the criteria for and use of the concept of mixed flora in respiratory gram stains, and you'll be able to describe cost-effective, clinically relevant strategies for the laboratory workup of lower respiratory tract specimen cultures. Before we begin, a few quotes. First, from Jay Sanford, an infectious disease physician. The, majority, the major goal of the Clinical Microbiology Laboratory is to provide information of maximal clinical or epidemiological usefulness as rapidly and as is consistent with acceptable accuracy and minimal cost. The second, from Raymond Bartlett, the father of cost-effective clinically relevant microbiology, the culture of lower respiratory tract specimens may result in more unnecessary microbiologic effort than any other type of specimen. And you may have run into this as you have tried to work up lower respiratory tract specimens in your laboratory. First, let's begin with the discussion of the pathogenesis of pneumonia. The most common cause of pneumonia is aspiration of colonizing flora. This is also a frequent cause of ventilator-associated pneumonia in hospitalized patients. Second, inhalation of aerosols. This is how organisms such as Legionella, the dimorphic fungi, and mycobacterium tuberculosis are acquired. Last, and the least frequent, is hematologic seeding, seen most frequently in intravenous drug users and hemodialysis patients. One of the most difficult things that we run into in trying to interpret lower respiratory tract cultures is the concept of, is it just part of the resident oral flora or is it a potential pathogen? And as you can see from this slide, there are many organisms that we considered potential pathogens that are also part of the resident oral flora. These include organisms such as Staph aureus, Haemophilus influenza, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Moraxella cateralis, and the wide variety of gram-negative bacilli that we see in our laboratory. Also important to remember is that the oral flora can reach concentrations anywhere from 10 to the 10th to 10 to the 12th organisms per ml. Let's first talk about the utility of the gram stain. The gram stain, despite all of the many new high-tech tests that we do in our laboratory now, is still one of the most rapid, the most inexpensive, and if we do it well, most informational tests that we can do in microbiology. First, it allows us to evaluate specimen quality. We can identify superficially contaminated specimens, and we'll realize that these specimens may lead to potentially misleading information. And it allows us to enhance the discrimination between samples with potential pathogens versus colonizing flora. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. It also allows us to provide a presumptive organism identification to our clinicians. This allows the rational selection of a preliminary empiric antibiotic, and it also, perhaps even potentially more importantly, allows us to guide our interpretation of our culture results. Now, the majority of the literature supports the clinical usefulness of the gram stain smear. Now, if you look at the literature, there is a wide range of reported sensitivity of the gram stain smear for lower respiratory cultures. And this ranges anywhere from 35 to 96 percent, with a specificity of 12 percent to 85 percent. So why this big range? Well, partly because the reference standard is the sputum culture. In most studies, there is no standardization of how sputum cultures are collected, nor how they are interpreted. Also, there are multiple criteria, if you look in the literature, for assessing gram stain smears. These are just some recent studies on the utility of the gram stain. 
You can see for the most part, for the diagnosis of most of our common community-acquired pathogens, such as Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenza, and Moraxella cateralis, the gram stain has a relatively high sensitivity. For some of the studies, such as Musher's study in 2004, where the sensitivity for Streptococcus pneumoniae was relatively low at 57%, this study did include patients that were on antibiotics. One of the most important things to remember about the lower respiratory tract gram stain is that the gram stain itself does not diagnose the presence of pneumonia. Pneumonia is a clinical and radiologic diagnosis, but once the diagnosis of pneumonia has been made, based on clinical or radiographic findings, the gram stain is useful in determining a probable etiologic agent. Also, some slightly older studies about the utility of the gram stain. Heinemann and colleagues in 1977 demonstrated that 50%, half of the information gleaned from sputum cultures, is clinically misleading in the absence of correlation with the direct, direct gram stain results. In addition, Gleckman also reported the selection of appropriate monotherapy 94% of the time when guided by the bacterial morphotypes in the direct specimen gram stain. In addition, the Infectious Disease Society of America and the American Thoracic Society consensus guidelines on both community-acquired pneumonia as well as the management of healthcare, ventilator-associated, and hospital-acquired pneumonia, again, also support the use of sputum cultures as well as gram stains. They indicate that sputum cultures have a major impact on the care of individualized patients and primarily by producing um, appropriate antimicrobial um, susceptibility results that can be interpreted. But more importantly, a reliable respiratory gram stain can again direct initial empiric therapy. Also remember, culture results are not available immediately, so again, gram stains are the first look into what might be causing an infection in that particular patient. Now the first thing, before we even get to the part about, you know, screening our gram stains, looking at organism morphology, is optimal smear preparation and staining. This is the precursor to producing useful information. Also, we want to use standardized screening criteria so that smears are consistently interpreted and we can appropriately establish specimen quality. We also need to know when not to apply any screening criteria. So examples here would be, for instance, for Legionella culture. We would not reject or not process a specimen because it did not meet our screening criteria if um, we were looking for Legionella. Also, don't be afraid to use interpretive comments so that it's easier for clinicians to get the point that you're trying to make. I'll show you an example in just a second. This slide shows you, based on the literature, available gram stain screening criteria. Um, really doesn't make any difference which one your lab chooses to use. The important thing is to choose one and to use it. Many laboratories use the number of squamous epithelial cells per low power field, either less than or equal to 10 or less than or equal to 25 per low power field as a sign of uh, specimen acceptability. Some laboratories use the ratio of neutrophils to squamous cells, and some or, uh, laboratories use the absence or presence of organisms per oil immersion field. Again, whichever one you choose to use is perfectly fine. You just need to make sure that you use one. Why do we want to screen? Here is the perfect example of a poor quality respiratory specimen. This field is loaded with squamous epithelial cells, and most importantly, you can see in this close-up shot, all of the bacteria that are associated with those squamous cells. If that specimen were cultured, all of that bacteria would grow, and again, potentially produce misleading results. What we want to see is a good quality specimen such as this, lots of neutrophils, no squamous cells. This is an example of a poorly collected specimen and a potential interpretive comment that you can report rather than culturing the specimen. So in this case, we've indicated that there are no neutrophils and many squamous epithelial cells, and we've included the comment, not representative of lower respiratory tract secretions, culture not performed, but we always include the comment, 
please consult with microbiology if clinical considerations warrant complete processing of this specimen. And then we indicate how long we'll keep the specimen before discarding it. Now I'd like to introduce the concept of mixed flora. Now this is something that we only use with the gram stains of lower respiratory tract specimens. So it doesn't apply to wounds, tissues, fluids, any other types of specimens that you would perform a direct gram stain on. With this, we use objective criteria, and that would be the number of organisms present per oil immersion field, to distinguish resident flora or colonizers from potential pathogens. Okay? With the concept that if lower numbers of the organisms are present, then this may be an indicator of, again, resident flora or colonization. So using this concept, we would need to see at least 10 or more gram-negative bacilli per oil immersion field in order to actually report the gram-negative bacilli. For more axella, we would need to see at least 25 organisms per oil immersion field. For staph, at least 50. And in order to call Streptococcus pneumoniae, at least 25 pairs per oil immersion field. So let's look at an example of a mixed flora gram stain and how much it helps with interpretation. The gram stain on the left that you see here is actually a gram stain that was reported out in my laboratory when I first arrived. I spoke frequently with our infectious disease physicians about how much they used the gram stain in order to determine empiric therapy. And they said, frankly, not very much. Because if you look at this gram stain, it's very difficult to determine which are the important organisms. So using the concept of mixed flora and the criteria that I told you about, this is how we now report this gram stain. The only organism that reaches the appropriate criteria for being reported are the gram-positive diplococci. And as you'll see, we report them as gram-positive diplococci, suggestive of pneumococcus. The remaining organisms are then reported as mixed flora. You can see that this is much easier to read and interpret if you're a clinician. Okay, let's look at some gram stains. Now I know that you all are gonna know what these organisms are, but of course here we have some nice plump gram negative rods. And rather than just calling them gram negative rods, since they look so very much like the enteric gram negative rods that we're used to seeing, why not report them as enteric-like gram-negative bacilli. And remember, if we're looking in a respiratory gram stain, we need to see at least 10 before we would report them. How about these small gram-negative cacobacilli that in a respiratory specimen we know is haemophilus? So why not report them as gram-negative cacobacilli suggestive of haemophilus? Again, requiring at least 10 organisms per oil immersion field to report. Otherwise, if we see less than 10, remember, we're going to be calling it mixed flora. Also, the non-enteric-like gram-negative bacilli. These are the kind of longer, thinner, sometimes people might describe them as hot dog-shaped gram-negative bacilli. Again, we would only report them if there were at least 10 per oil immersion field. Here we see gram-negative diplococci that are suggestive of moraxella. In order to report them, we would rep need to see at least 25 organisms per oil immersion field. And here are the classic lancet-shaped, gram-positive, usually diplococci, sometimes short chains, of Streptococcus pneumoniae. So again, rather than just calling them gram-positive diplococci, we can report them as gram-positive cocci suggestive of pneumococcus, remembering that we need to see at least 25 pairs per oil immersion field to report them. And here are the classic gram-positive cocci and clusters that we associate with Staphylococcus. So again, rather than reporting them as gram-positive cocci and clusters and hoping that a clinician understands what clusters mean, we can go ahead and report them as gram-positive cocci suggestive of Staphylococcus, remembering that we need to see at least 50 in order to report them in our direct gram stain. Now, which organisms would we automatically report as mixed flora in a respiratory gram stain? 
Well, here's a lovely example of gram-positive cocci suggestive of streptococcus, which we might report in a wound, tissue, or fluid specimen. But in a routine respiratory gram stain, this would be lumped into the mixed flora category. Similarly, the gram-positive rods that are either suggestive of bacillus, bacillus clostridium, as you see on the left, or that are suggestive of diphtheroids or cornibacterium on the right, again, would become part of the mixed flora for reporting. Last but not least, one of the most important things that we don't want to report in a respiratory gram stain would be yeast. And if you remember only one thing from this presentation is that you are really doing your patients a disservice if you report in your routine respiratory gram stains yeast. You want to stay away from that, again, because what it usually results in is patients being unnecessarily treated for yeast infections or respiratory yeast infections that they don't have. Okay, so just a recap of our mixed flora criteria. In order to call a gram-negative bacilli, whether it be an enteric, a non-enteric, or a homophilus-like gram-negative bacilli, we need to see at least 10 organisms per oil immersion field. In order to call more axella, we need to see at least 25 organisms, staph, at least 50, and streptococcus pneumoniae, at least 25 pairs. Remember, anything that we cannot call streptococcus pneumoniae, that is a streptococcus, as well as the gram-positive bacilli and yeast, will be simply reported as mixed flora in our gram stain, regardless of quantity. Okay, we've done our gram stain. Now let's think about how we're going to work up our respiratory cultures. Well, if you look in the literature, there are really no clear guidelines for working up bacterial cultures. Um, sometimes, you know, we may look to the literature not very much there. We may rely on our colleagues. And what you may find is that different technologists working in the same lab may work up cultures entirely differently. Okay, so there seems to be some need for consistency when we perform these culture workups. It'll give us uniformity in our workup and reporting of bacterial isolates, as well as uniformity in which isolates have susceptibility testing performed on them. So a few premises here. Now, we all realize that polymorphin nuclear neutrophils are an indication of infection or inflammation. And we also agree that squamous epithelial cells indicate superficial contamination. Now, if a specimen contains a large number of squamous epithelial cells, superficial contamination is very likely, and most of the time that specimen should probably be recollected. But if it can't be, we don't want to be performing an extensive amount of testing on these heavily mixed cultures because of their potential for producing misleading information. So I'd like to talk about two systems for working up respiratory cultures. The first is the quality score or Q-score system. And the second is a modification of that system called the Q234 system. Let's begin with the quality score system. This was developed again by Raymond Bartlett back in the early 1970s. It's based on the premise of the quality score or Q-score which equates to the number of potential pathogens in a culture that we'll, we will work up. Okay, so if we look at our respiratory gram stain, we screen it for the number of neutrophils and squamous cells. You can see that on the left-hand vertical axis here, the number of neutrophils, or the relative number, is associated with a positive score from one to three, based on whether we see one to nine neutrophils per low power field, 10 to 24, or greater than 25. Similarly, along the top uh, axis, you can see that squamous cells, again, because they are a negative indicator of quality, the more that are present results in a more negative score. So if we have a respiratory specimen that has 10 to 24 neutrophils per low power field, it gets a score of plus two, and say it has one to nine squamous epithelial cells per low power field. That's a score of minus one. So you simply add your two scores together. So plus two minus one gives you a quality score of one. So in this case, with a quality score of one, we will work up one potential pathogen in that culture. So you can see that the maximum number 
of, path of pathogens that will get worked up in a culture using this system is three. Also, I want you to notice that any specimen that contains no neutrophils, but also contains no squamous cells, is given the highest score because of those patients who may not be able to mount a neutrophil response. Okay, so with the quality score system, up to three organisms can be considered potential pathogens that are considered potential pathogens will be worked up. And by worked up, I mean complete identification and susceptibility testing when appropriate. The lower the quality of the specimen, so that means the more squamous epithelial cells present, the fewer organisms or the fewer potential pathogens that will get worked up. So let's look at a brief example here. So if we have two potential pathogens in our culture and we have a quality score of three, so our potential pathogens are less than or equal to our quality score, we will work up those potential pathogens with complete identification and susceptibility testing if appropriate. Now, if the number of potential pathogens in our culture exceeds our quality score, so say we have three potential pathogens, but our quality score is only two, then we look back to the direct gram stain. And we work up those potential pathogens that were seen in the gram stain with complete identification and susceptibility testing. Now, what if all of them are seen in the direct smear? Then we don't work up any of them because you can't tell which one is more important and we perform what we call a morphologic identification. And that's basically any kind of rapid test that we can do, uh, catalase, oxidase, indole, strep typing, staph latex, to provide a kind of gross morphologic identification for our organism at that particular time. Now let's look at the Q234 system, which was developed by Susan Sharp as a modification of the quality score system in 2002. Now with the Q234 system, you can use whichever gram stain quality assessment you would like to use. Say in your laboratory, you're currently using the criteria of less than 10 squamous epithelial cells per low power field to assess your quality. You can go ahead and use that. You don't have to use the same system that um, I just previously talked about with the quality score system. So you can reject or process any specimen according to your normal protocol. In this system, the culture workup is based on the number of potential pathogens present. So if there are two pathogens or two potential pathogens, you would work them up, up to two potential pathogens. If there are four potential pathogens, they all get a morphologic identification. And if there are three, then similar to the Q-score system, you would look to the gram stain and work up less than or equal to two potential pathogens if they were seen in the gram stain or if all three were seen in the gram stain, then you would perform a morphologic identification on all three of them. Now, also another caveat that you could implement with this system is that if your mixed flora, your normal resonant flora that grows in lower respiratory tract specimens is in a greater quantity than your potential pathogens, then you can go ahead and perform just a morphologic identification on your potential pathogens. So let's look at some examples comparing these two systems and how they relate to working up cultures. So in our first example, we have a sputum. In the gram stain, we saw many polymorphonuclear leukocytes, few squamous epithelial cells, many enteric light gram negative bacilli, many gram positive cocci suggestive of staph, and a few yeast, which we called mixed flora. In our culture, we had moderate growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa, moderate growth of E. coli, moderate growth of Staph aureus, and a few yeast. Okay, so using the Q score system, we would determine that our quality score, based on our neutrophils and squamous cell from our direct gram stain, is a 2. Plus 3, minus 1, means that we would work up two potential pathogens in this culture. Well, how many do we have? I think most people would agree that we have three, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, E. coli, and Staph aureus. So in this case, our potential pathogens exceeds our quality score. So what do we do? We look back to the gram stain. What did we see in the gram stain? Well, we saw the enteric-like gram-negative bacilli and the Staph. 
So in this case, we would work up the E. coli and the Staph aureus performing identification and susceptibility testing. We would perform a morphologic identification on the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and we would report mixed flora. Now what about with the Q234 system? Again, three potential pathogens. We would look back to the gram stain, very similar to the Q score. And again, we would work up the E. coli and the Staph aureus, perform a morphologic identification on the Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and report mixed flora. So this is an example of where using either system resulted in reporting the exact same results. Let's look at another example. Again, a sputum. The direct gram stain had many neutrophils, moderate squamous epithelial cells, many non-enteric-like gram-negative bacilli, and moderate mixed flora. Our culture grew many Pseudomonas virginosa, moderate Staph aureus, and a few Viridan streptococci. Now using the quality score system, again, plus three minus two gives us a quality score of one, which means we will work up one potential pathogen. How many do we have? Well, in this case, the Pseudomonas origin, originosa and the Staph aureus, so we have two. So again, here, we've exceeded our quality score. We look back to the gram stain, and in this case, we saw the many non-enteric gram-negative bacilli, but we didn't see any staph. Okay, so in this case, we would then, because we saw the pseudomonas in the gram stain, we would work that up with identification and susceptibility testing. We would perform a morphologic identification on the staph aureus, and we would report the viridan streptococci as mixed flora. Now with the Q234 system, again, two potential pathogens. So what does that say? Well, if we have up to two potential pathogens, we work them both up. So using this particular example, the Q234 system, we would work up both the Pseudomonas aeruginosa and the Staph aureus, and then we would report mixed flora. So again, this is an example of where you would work up slightly more with the Q234 system than you would with the Q-score system. Okay, one last example. This is a tracheal aspirate. The direct gram stain had many neutrophils, few squamous epithelial cells, and many mixed flora. And that was made up of a few enteric-like gram-negative bacilli, some moderate gram-positive -pos cocci suggestive of staph. In our culture, we grew moderate diphtheroids, moderate coag-negative staph, few E. coli, and rare staph aureus. Now again, Using our Q-score system, our quality score would be 2, again, plus 3, minus 1. So we would work up to two potential pathogens. How many potential pathogens do we have in this culture? I think most people would agree, two, the E. coli and the Staph aureus. So again, the number of potential pathogens is equivalent to our quality score. So we would work up both the E. coli and the Staph aureus, and we would report the remaining organisms, the diphtheroids and the coagulase negative staph, as mixed flora. Okay, so again, with the Q234 system, two potential pathogens. So we would work up the E. coli and the Staph aureus, right? Well, if we remember our caveat, where we said that if the mixed flora in this case, the diphtheroids and the coagulase negative staph is in a higher quantity than our potential pathogens, then we would just perform a morphologic identification on our potential pathogens. So in this case, we would per, um, report mixed flora and a morphologic identification on our E. coli and staph aureus. So this is an example of where the Q-score system would result in the organisms being worked up, and the Q234 system, they would not. So those were just some examples to kind of help cement the use of those two systems for you. Now, the premise for the quality systems is based on the published prevalence of potential pathogen colonization of the oropharynx, which we know is relatively high. Also, the more superficially contaminated a specimen, the higher the number of colonizing organisms that are likely to be present. We also know that the quality of the specimen is important in, not only in determining its acceptability for culture, but also the extent of culture workup. 
Another important premise is that if organisms are seen in the direct specimen smear, there's a greater chance that they're associated with an infective process, simply because of the number of organisms that we need to be able, or that need to be present for us to be able to see them at um, oil immersion in a gram stain. Now the advantages of the quality systems is that it offers a consistent approach for interpreting cultures. It's based on specimen quality, primarily squamous epithelial cells, the presence of squamous epithelial cells. It's based on the organisms seen in the gram stain. Okay, remember, the organisms seen in the smear should be in a significant number in the specimen. And it also limits the number of organisms that we work up from mixed cultures. And it limits the amount of potentially misleading information that we'll report from those cultures. Another important concept to remember is that no potential pathogen is ever ignored. All the potential pathogens are reported even though we may not perform complete identification and susceptibility testing. Also, the pathogens that some people believe should always be worked up, potentially things like Staph aureus and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, are identified and always indicated in the report. And the system can also be modified to include screening for organisms of epidemiologic significance, such as MRSA. Now, the important thing to remember is that these are guidelines. They offer a way to systematically approach your culture interpretation. They are just guidelines, and you can make exceptions. Any concerned physician can consult with microbiology to have further work performed on any culture that they think it, in which it would be clinically indicated. I've also included some references here. The ASM Cumitec 7B on lower respiratory tract infections has a lot of good information about both the Q-score system and the Q234 system. And also a publication by Matkowski et al. in 2006, published in the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, evaluates the Q-score and Q234 system for working up wound cultures. So you can also use these systems for working up your wound tissue and fluid specimens as well. So in conclusion, hopefully you now understand how important and how useful the direct gram stain of respiratory specimens is. It allows you to assess specimen quality. It allows you to provide a rapid presumptive identification. And it also guides your culture workup. So as your mother always used to tell you, watch your P's and Q's. Determine your P's or your potential pathogens. Pick one of the Q's or the quality score systems and be able to report clinically cost-effective relevant results. Also again, important to remember that these systems can also be used to work up specimens other than respiratory specimens, including wounds, tissues, and fluids. Thank you for joining the discussion today on the workup of respiratory cultures.